Privit Moy Druzy. Hello, my friends. Today, I want to talk about an interesting article that just popped up, and I want to try to help you understand why. Um, so, Bill Clinton said that he was to blame. He said that it was his nuke deal that's to blame for what's going on in Ukraine. And I appreciate him being willing to say that, but he's wrong. Like you could not have blamed uh, Clinton for what happened there because Clinton couldn't possibly have known what was going to happen down the line. I, I voted against Bill Clinton twice. I work on campaigns against him, but I'm giving him a pass because he deserves to have a pass. And it made sense at the time. He said this, I feel a personal stake because I got them, that's Ukraine, to give up their nuclear weapons. Now, at the time, giving up their nuclear weapons looked like it was making the world safer. You had fewer countries that had nuclear weapons. It would be, you know, you'd only have to deal with Russia. You wouldn't have to deal with both Russia and Ukraine. It seemed to make sense. Some Ukrainians have expressed the belief that Moscow would not have ordered its troops over the border into the country in February 2022 had Ukraine held on to these weapons. Well, one, Ukraine had the weapons, but they didn't control them. Like, they didn't have the codes for them and that kind of thing. Maybe they could have worked it out over time, but that, that was part of what was actually going on at the time. Kiev did so with guarantees from the U.S., the U.K., and the Russian Federation. So it looked perfectly safe at the time, and that's part of the problem. So this was also carried, this was in Newsweek, and this was also carried in RT. And RT actually surprisingly said much the same thing that was carried in Newsweek. But if we roll the clock back far enough, you wouldn't have seen this either. Zelensky bolsters his ties with Poland. For hundreds of years, Poland and Ukraine had been at each other over time. So uh, that Ukraine and Poland are so tight together now, well, it's partly a consequence of the USSR, but it would have been hard to predict at some point. And I only say that to say this, it, you can't fault someone for what they don't know or can't predict logically with the information that they have. Now, let me make my case. So here, this is a map of World War II. I just constructed it just, uh, and I left some things out, right? I only had the big players and some of their territories. I left out what was going on in, in uh, Myanmar and uh, some other places around the, uh, around the globe. But the main players were basically, there was the U.S., the U.K., uh, and the USSR, and then some of the U.K.'s particularly allies like India and Australia and Canada. And, right, and that's largely who was arrayed against Germany, uh, Italy, and Japan. And these are the areas that were allied with uh, Germany and Japan, like Austria and Hungary and Romania and Bulgaria and Croatia. They also allied with them. And then these were conquered territories like Netherlands, Belgium, France, Poland, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, which were absorbed by the Germans first and then by the Russians after that. Finland was uh, being occupied. Norway was occupied. Sweden somehow marvelously dodged it. Over on this side, you see uh, Japan occupying China and the Philippines. And so <laughs> that's what was going on. That's the shape of the world in World War II. Now, you saw this in the news just a few days ago where Russia takes over the presidency of the UN Security Council, which is bad optics for the West. That's correct. It is bad optics for the West. But why? Because after World War II, China, France, the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom, and the United States made up five permanent council of uh, permanent members of the Security Council, and there was a reason for that. Let's go back to the map. Okay, the United States, the UK, France, which was allied but it was occupied for some time, Russia, all those, and then China to kind of counterbalance Japan's aggression. Okay, so that made sense. Now let's go to this. After World War II, the Soviet Union began expanding. Now, it had already absorbed the uh, Baltic states here. This is one of the reasons that the Baltic states are so hawkish about supporting Ukraine right now. Here we see, uh, this is about where uh, Latvia, or, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia are, right? And then Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, and Yugoslavia is aligned but not part of uh, the Warsaw Pact. And then you see NATO expansion about the same time, and one's kind of a reaction to the other. NATO came, at, you know, to into its being uh, 
as the Soviet Union started expanding before the Warsaw Pact itself began. And this, so these bloc countries became NATO. Okay, but the history of NATO started off with just uh, Norway, England, France, uh, and a few others, right? And then over time, they expanded. And this is why Russia says that NATO keeps moving east. Look at over here what's in green and what's in yellow, right? It keeps moving east. Well, it's not that NATO is moving east. It's that these countries, like Poland, don't want to be under the Soviet thumb or the Russian thumb now anymore. And so they can't pick up their country and move over here to the other side of France. So they are joining with that Western bloc to have some safety. So... That's what's happening now. So let's keep moving. And by the way, this is what the Soviet Union looked like and the expansion of Soviet ideology. If it's red, it's essentially a communist state. If it's orange, it's kind of moving into a deep socialism aligned with the Soviet Union. And yellow was some sympathy that wasn't really aligned. But it's, it's really interesting to see how just expansionistic the Soviet Union was. Now, <laughs> with all that as a background, let's look at this map. This is a map of the current situation. Here's Ukraine in black, right? Ukraine is being invaded by Russia. Russia is aligned with a few countries like Belarus, like Iran, like Syria, like North Korea. Venezuela will vote with them in the UN. Nicaragua will vote with them in the UN. That's what's arrayed against Ukraine. Essentially, all of NATO is arrayed against uh, Russia, and then some of NATO's friends like Australia, uh, Japan, South Korea are kind of within the bloc as well. But isn't this fascinating, like how different it is than World War II? So America is in the same place that it was before. England's in the same place it was before. This was the Axis, or the, the Allies, and the Allies are allied with the Axis of Germany and Italy and even Japan against Russia. It, it's really fascinating. So when I look at this map, I think, you know, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a lesson here. And the lesson is that I can't hold Bill Clinton liable for what he did by helping Ukraine give away those when he had the agreement with the US, the UK, and Russia. And that seemed solid. <clears throat> can't really fault him for that when he couldn't know what he couldn't know. Now here's the lesson. And the lesson is bounded rationality. Now, bounded rationality describes the way that humans make decisions that departs from perfect economic rationality. We can't know everything. Like, we're not omniscient. If we were God, we could see that this was coming, but we're not. We're, we're limited by what we actually understand, which is exactly why you need to expand your framework as much as humanly possible so that you can understand what's going on, because you're, you're limited by what you understand. And so you, you don't make perfect optimal decisions like economists talk about homo economicus the you know perfectly rational man making his rational decisions that's not how it works okay our rationality is limited by our thinking capacity the information that's available to us and time so because we are in a state of bounded rationality we can only make the decisions that we are capable of making with the framework we have and with that like so my wife will sometimes say things like you know, you know, we shouldn't have made that decision. And I'll remind her, look, we made the best decision with the information that we had at the time. And if we went back and with that same information, that's exactly what we would do again. So don't be so hard on yourself. We, we, we couldn't have made a better decision. And I think Bill Clinton, you know, he gets a pass here because he made the best decision that he could with that which he knew at the time. Now, that leads us to the next step. And that is, with what we're doing right now, we have to be aware that there could be repercussions down the line in what we do. So we have to make the best decision we can with the information that we have right now, knowing that things can play out and backfire and work cut the other way and those kind of things. So that's the lesson of bounded rationality. Make the best decision that you have with the information that you have at the time, but know that things could actually come back if you're not careful with it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.